my name is Morgan and I am a neuroscience researcher. Welcome to my channel and also welcome to 2021. So new year, not a new channel, exactly the same me, but the calendar got flipped. So <laughs> that's where we are right now. Um, we're still in quarantine and all of that super fun stuff, but the year is different. I wanted to say thank you so much to all of the people who have been subscribing to my channel. I have been really silent for like the last month because a lot of stuff was happening in the lab that was uh, a little bit more important than <laughs> sitting down and filming a video every week, but hopefully it's all sorted out now. Hopefully someday I'll be able to tell you guys about it. I'm thinking about maybe at some point starting like a, like a lab story time sort of segment, but that's for a future me to deal with and not for right now me. Today's video is one of my Mental Health Monday videos. So if you're new to this channel, every first Monday of every month, I sit down and talk about a concept in mental health from a neuroscientist perspective. I think it's really important that we discuss mental health and I think it's also really interesting to look at some things that might be recommended by, um, by people outside of neuroscience to see how it actually affects your brain or whether or not it, it works from a neuroscience standpoint. So I think that's just fun to look at. Today's video is extra special because it's my very first video 2021. So obviously I planned something really cool and awesome, right? No, that's not the case. This is just a normal <laughs> video. This is just a normal month of a normal year. We're not doing anything special here. <laughs> But today's video is one that I thought would be really interesting because it's one that I've heard recommended, I've heard people talk about, but I've never heard neuroscientists talk about it. I've never heard anyone who really like looks at the brain as like its own organ uh, talk about on their own. And also it came up recently because my own therapist recommended it to me. So it's like, of course, one of the dangers of having a neuroscientist as a client is that I'm going to go and research everything that's recommended to me. And the, what I found on this topic I thought was really interesting. So today we're going to be talking about art therapy. So first of all, what in the world is art therapy? Um, this is a definition that I pulled from the American Art As Therapy Association. Uh, they say that art therapy is an integrative mental health and human services profession that enriches the lives of individuals, families, and communities through active art making, creative processes, applied psychological theory, and human experience within a psychotherapeutic relationship. But what it really boils down to is therapist using art as a medium to help their their to help their client understand themselves better. Art therapy does require, I believe, a master's degree to practice and you are meant to go to an actual art therapist, but your average everyday therapist can recommend that you use art and that is still kind of art therapy from what I understand. So for example, my therapist recommended that I paint something so that is technically art therapy. We're trying to understand myself better through that. Um, other means of art therapy, it could be watercolors, pastel, some people make uh, paper mache, some people use clay. Anything that could be considered art in conjunction with therapy is then art therapy. The theory behind art therapy is that we can use art to describe emotions and feelings and memories that maybe we don't exactly have the words for just yet or maybe we haven't fully processed it yet but through our art we can sort of interpret it and then discuss it a little easier. People who recommend art therapy often say that it allows someone to sort of reframe their experience and look at it from a different angle and it can also help us organize our thoughts a little bit more. And I had to do a lot of research into this just to sort of figure out what art therapy is and how we might better understand it from a neuroscience perspective and I found a really interesting uh, woman who is a researcher in the field and I will link a few videos by her in the description. They'll be under like YouTube videos and just some recommendations if you're wanting to look more into it or see how we can maybe view this from a neuroscience perspective. But that will be in the description along with all of the links to all of the sources that I use today just like I do with every other video. Some things that art therapy is commonly used to treat is anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, or really any traumatic event that someone needs help dealing with, uh, dementia, and other mental illnesses. And also, it seems that some people 
are investigating using it for physical illness as well. Um, but its efficacy for physical illnesses is more, um, the evidence for it is a bit lacking and more research needs to be done before we make any claims about how therapy can help physically. So an issue that we run into a lot and that I think will probably become a common theme with these Mental Health Monday videos is that concepts in therapy and even in art therapy are often very difficult to look at it through neuroscience or through other um, what you might call hard sciences because these hard sciences want objective data. We want numbers. We want to be able to see a neuron and see what it's doing. We don't really work in subjective experiences because they are subjective. And so what might work for one person won't work for another person. And what one patient may report, other patients will not report. So it, it makes these studies very difficult to conduct. For art therapy specifically, it's extremely difficult to not be subjective because art itself is subjective. So there's not really a way to look at it objectively. You can't walk into someone who's painting something that they say expresses their emotions and then say, well, no, it doesn't because you didn't follow these rules of art. Well, that's not constructive to therapy at all. There's also the extremely subjective part of therapy of um, it has to do with interpersonal relations. You could find a therapist who's amazing, who's helped many, many of their clients, but because you and that therapist don't vibe personally, um, that therapist isn't going to work for you and you're not going to be able to do the proper work on yourself that you need to do. So does that mean that's a bad therapist? Does that mean that therapy doesn't work? No, it means that therapist specifically didn't work for you. Conducting studies also oftentimes involves having a control group, but imagine trying to form a control group for art therapy. Um, you, you really can't because typically in medicine you would do that using a placebo. So like one group would get like a real medicine and another group would get a placebo medicine. But in art therapy, you can't tell one person okay, here are real paints and here are fake paints. That's not really <laughs> possible. So having your having like a randomized control trial is super difficult. So with that, all of that being said, there are some limitations of doing this research, but um, what I'm going to be talking about is the current thoughts on this. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's 100% true. I think you should take everything with a grain of salt and you should also do your own research. Don't take everything that I say as the gospel because it's not. This is one person doing their own research. You're welcome to do your own as well and that's why I link all of my sources in the description. So let's work on the assumption that art therapy works. Many people who practice art therapy who have gone through it say that it does. So let's also say that it does. How does it work? How does doing art help your brain at all? Many therapists who support art therapy believe that it activates different brain regions. So for example, if you're working with sort of a softer medium, a more abstract medium such as watercolors, it's going to activate the more creative and emotional sides of your brain. And then if you work with something that's more hard, like a pen or a pencil, um, it's going to activate the more cognitive, thoughtful parts of your brain. Whether or not this is true is yet to be determined because doing these studies, like I said, is extremely difficult. And um, the, currently the imaging techniques that we have is really lacking to be able to tell whether or not different parts of your brain are active with different mediums. There are a lot of people doing research into how to better study the brain because the, these new imaging techniques that we could develop to study this could also help us with many other things because really the major limitation of most brain imaging techniques is that the patient needs to stay, stay still during it. Well, you can't create art while you're sitting still. So, um, so creating more imaging techniques would really help us not only study this, but other aspects of our brain. <laughs> our brain is active whenever we're doing things and it would be nice to be able to see exactly what it's doing. There are some people who have attempted to conduct fMRI studies, but again, the limitation is that you have to sit still. So it's more of a snapshot of your brain during the process of creating art rather than the your brain throughout the entire process. So this is a theory that is out there, but there's not really any data to support it just yet. 
many therapists who support art therapy also believe it's more of a way for us to tap into our subconscious or our unconscious. Um, so by producing this art, we, we may produce symbols that we believe represent us without fully processing that. And so by doing that, we're able to create this piece of art and then look at it and realize something about ourselves. Again, I would take everything that I'm saying with a grain of salt, the whole distinction between conscious between our conscious and unconscious self is still something that's like highly debated. So I don't know. <laughs> to support art therapy, there are a ton, like a ton of case studies saying that it works. So I think at one point, if you have enough people saying that it works, maybe it does. But also, there's a ton of people who say that essential oils work and they don't. So <laughs> I would like to think that it does. There are some studies that have shown that whenever a, um, a dementia patient you, does art therapy, their dementia seems to slow, the, the progression of it seems to slow down. Um, but again, the argument could be made that that's more because their brain is staying active than because of the art therapy specifically, because there are other studies that show if you play Sudoku or if you do things that involve math or reading, just anything to do to keep your brain active, will help slow the dementia so but art therapy is one way to do it so that's worth something there are therapists who are trying to get around the issue of how subjective art therapy is by using cortisol studies so cortisol is a stress hormone it's released whenever we are stressed or anxious and so these therapists are taking cortisol measures through spit samples which not to get super complicated but whenever cortisol is released during stress it does come up in a spit sample very very quickly so a spit sample is a very fast and accurate measurement of objective stress um, but also everyone's natural cortisol levels are different. So you need like a baseline cortisol measurement for that person rather than saying, oh, well, everyone's was at this number and then it went to this number. It has to be like so-and-so's cortisol is normally at this level and then it went to this level or it went to this level and not so much like she was at 16, now she's at 17, so it's higher, um, if that makes any sense. <laughs> so these researchers will take a um, cortisol measurement before the therapy session and one after the therapy session and based on these research studies it does seem that art therapy helps lower the cortisol but the argument could be made that that's just because they're in with a therapist or because they're spending time relaxing and also some people have issues with these studies because they say that the the sample size is too small so what is the overall message of this video is does art therapy work is art therapy good um, I prefer for these Mental Health Monday videos to be optimistic, for them to be tips, for you to be able to take these and implement them in your daily life to help you improve your own mental health. But with the art therapy, it's kind of mixed. It seems that art therapists are 100% behind it. Many uh, behavioral therapists are 100% behind it. Neuroscientists are less so behind it. But I think as someone currently in the neuroscience field, neuroscientists tend to be overly skeptical sometimes, I think. I think we really want this objective data when we can't have it, and that upsets us a lot of the times. That's why I'm in neuroscience and not in psychology. <laughs> but I think at the end of the day, art is a way to express yourself creatively, and it's a way to sort of get out some creative energy, get out some emotions. Maybe if you want to sling a paintbrush around, it could be a way to get out anger, and it doesn't hurt anyone. You could go pick up a thing of paints at Walmart for like two bucks. You get a sheet of paper out of a notebook and just paint. You could finger paint. You don't even have to buy the paintbrushes. So I think it's cheap. It doesn't hurt anyone. And if it makes you feel better, you should do it. And I, I don't think there's any harm in it at all. I think it would be super interesting to have more data on it. I think it would be amazing if we could get these studies done to see what parts of the brain it does activate. And if there truly is this differentiation between uh, hard mediums and soft mediums and being in different parts of your brain, that would be fascinating. Unfortunately, we just don't have that data right now, but I think it's still an interesting concept. So I hope that 
you've enjoyed this video. I hope it was somewhat educational. Um, please, if you feel like it, leave a comment down below of some other mental health techniques, practices, things your therapist have recommended to you um, that you'd like for me to talk about. I would love to do more research into it. That's part of the reason why I started this series. I find it fascinating to look at all of these concepts from a neuroscience perspective and see sort of what we do and don't have data on because it's not always that it doesn't work. It's just that it's difficult to collect data on some of these things. So that's the end of this video. Go make some art if you feel like it. Leave a comment below if you feel like it. Maybe like the video, maybe subscribe. It's completely up to you. But whatever you do, have a great day. Bye.